Hello friends, Marty Braden here doing another video for my channel. These are short 15 minute videos from a Latter-day Saints perspective on Richard Dawkins' anti-theist, anti-Christ book, The God Delusion. Because it's his book, he's an atheist, and I'm specifically going to rebut that. My book is called An Atheist Delusion, and this is part 23 of those series of videos. I closed off part 22 saying, if there have been numberless iterations from the parent amoebas to the ancestor apes, <laughs> then their missing link great-grandparents, grandparents, and parents that supposedly are our connections to our amoeba or worm multi-millionth ancestor, genealogically speaking, should be walking or squirming amongst us to, even today. I remember as a teen, I, I, 12, 13, 14, right around there, those electric probes, you go into the lawn, you know, watered the lawn and late at night, boom, it'd go, boom, electric heat, and all the worms would come up. Well, I was able to go find my great, 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 father worm. <laughs> Just kidding. These ancestors with all their various stages or iterations should show up in their new kind, right? But there isn't any. Nope, not one. It's true that there may be small mutations within some of these kinds, meaning within the species of their specific kind, but never an ancestor who managed to jump over to a totally different kind. For example, a dog in its DNA and genes jumping over to a cat kind so that we can now call them our dog kitty. <laughs> our dog kitty grandparents. Come on, man. Anyhow, the fact is that all these kinds are in their finished perfect form, just as God organized them when he said, and it is good. It's not necessary for our scientific brethren to search in uh, the deserts and climb the mountains tops and, and the depths of the sea in a hopeless effort to find these so-called missing links. I appreciate all that they do in their research. Don't, mi don't misunderstand me here, but the, they're never going to find that missing link because it's never been produced, that's for sure. So let's pick it up from there. I'm gonna go right where we left off, okay. And looking for the best resources that's, to answer the question, what is the official stance of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, of its leaders, in other words, on the question of evolution? I came across an article in the Daily Universe, an online Utah paper that took um, what I believe to be a very fair and balanced historical approach to answer the question, what is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints' official position on the subject of evolution? Let me again say that my book is not an official book of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, nor do I represent the Church in any official way. That said, here is the article I found that offers what Rachel Keeler, its author, felt the church's official stance is on the theory of evolution. It's titled, The Church and BYU, An Evolution Dash of Evolution, back in July 30th of 2020, uh, 2019. BYU and the theory of evolution haven't always coexisted peacefully. <laughs> That's an understatement. Over the course of more than a century, BYU and the teaching of evolution have developed harmony, though. According to the historical site Signature Books, in the early 1900s, President George H. Brimhall desired to transform Brigham Young Academy into a true university. Brimhall hired four intellectual and well-educated men who held either master's or doctorate degrees from the University of Chicago, Harvard, and Berkeley to bring scholarship to the new university. These intellectuals, brothers Joseph and Henry Peterson and brothers Ralph and William Chamberlain, celebrated Darwinism, taught organic evolution, theology, and scriptural explanation. Now, in 1909, the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints caught wind of what these professors were teaching at BYU and released an official statement primarily on the theory of evolution and the beliefs of the church called the origin of man. The statement reads, quote, It is held by some that Adam was not the first man upon this earth and that the original human being was a development from lower orders of the animal creation. These, however, are the theories of men. The word of the Lord declared that Adam was the first man of all men. This message from the first presidency was anti-evolution and anti-science. Because of this statement, many students at BYU became opposed to the teachings of organic evolution and its correlation with religion and were angry with the school. Over the next two years, Brimhall dismissed the four professors to keep the peace at BYU. Sunstone Magazine released an article, quote, campus in crisis with statements from the professors and an explanation of what occurred during that time. Intellectual Henry Peterson wrote a letter to the Provo Herald and spoke with Sunstone on how he felt um, himself hurt by the accusations that he was destroying faith. Readers don't 
let people tell you from the pulpit, he said, or otherwise, that to accept evolution means to forsake your faith or deny God. He said that's not true, Peter said. Evolution is the process by which God works. That was his belief. Hmm, interesting. In 1925, science teacher John Scopes was prosecuted for teaching evolution at a public school in Tennessee, one of the many states which had, re which had recently made teaching evolution a misdemeanor. This trial, known as the Scopes Monkey Trial, sparked debate about the controversial topic of evolution and whether it should be legal to teach it. The First Presidency again released an official statement during the time of the Scopes Trial, entitled Mormon View of Evolution, which offered the Church's stance on evolution. This statement was a shorter, edited version of The Origin of Man and did not contain any anti-evolution material this time. 1930-31, Elder Joseph Fielding Smith, then an apostle, he later became the president of the church and head prophet, gave a general conference talk in 1930 stating that there was no death before Adam and no such thing as pre-Adamites. B.H. Roberts, and I want to just interject back in a, another video, I mentioned B.H. Roberts, an author of the um, Comprehensive History of the Church and some books on the Book of Mormon, Historicity and that kind of thing, and I mistakenly quote him as a, an apostle. I meant to say he's a member of the Seventy at that time, okay? So B.H. Roberts of the Seventy stated he believed otherwise and presented concerns. Elder Roberts was writing a book called The Truth, The Way, The Life that discussed religion and evolution cohesively, but the book was challenged by Joseph Fielding Smith and was not published until 1995. According to an article on the history of the church's view on evolution, Joseph Fielding Smith and B.H. Roberts were called in to meet with the First Presidency to discuss the dispute. Sound like the principal calling in the students, didn't it? I'm just being facetious. Anyhow, Joseph Fielding Smith referred back to the scriptures in the 1909 address, whereas B.H. Roberts brought the scientific evidence and findings to that discussion. The First Presidency released a statement to all general authorities in 1931 with instruction to leave science to the scholars. Quote, our mission is to bear the message of the restored gospel to the people of the world, the statement reads. Leave geology, biology, archaeology, and anthropology, and I would add cosmology, none of which has to do with the salvation of the souls of mankind to the scientific researchers, while we magnify our calling in the realm of the church, end quote. Elder James E. Talmadge, then an apostle, gave a speech about the progression of the earth and evolution called The Earth and Man. This talk was not published until November of 1931 because it was challenged by another member of the Quorum of the Twelve. The First Presidency decided to publish the speech in the newspaper and as a pamphlet because the church's official stance on evolution was neutral, and the only view from the Quorum so far was Joseph Fielding Smith's anti-evolution talk. 1950s, Canadian scientist Howard Stutz was the first to teach a graduate course in evolutionary biology at BYU. Evolution biology is Dawkins' expertise. Stutz um, taught a class on cytogenetics, the study of chromosome mechanics. The topic of evolution was still controversial at that time, especially with the publishing of two heavily anti-evolution books from general authorities, Joseph Fielding Smith's, Joseph Fielding Smith's Man, His Origin and Destiny, which had me, you've heard me quote much from his book in my early videos on this uh, history, this uh, introduction. In 1954, and in uh, then 70, Elder Bruce R. McConkie later became a member of the Cormorant Trail, but he was a 70 at the time that he wrote Mormon Doctrine in 1958. Despite this, Stutz continued to encourage those he taught that evolution and religion are intertwined. Not only is the concept of organic evolution completely compatible with the gospel as found in the scriptures, but it is very at the very heart of it, Stutz said. In 1957, President David O. McKay wrote a letter to University of Utah geology professor William Lee Stokes about evolution and said Joseph Fielding Smith's book was not authorized nor looked over by the church before it was published. They didn't say they disagreed with it or agreed with it, just said it wasn't authorized and never got out there before they could meet as a quorum and that kind of thing on the topic. BYU evolutionary biology professor Dwayne Jeffrey said, Quote, by the end of the 50s and 60s, all of the seminary teachers and religious teachers have become very anti-science. Others who, were, uh, who weren't uh, that anti-science had to be very quiet, however. Okay. In the 60s, by the mid-60s, things were loosening up a little, a little bit. In 1965, the Church magazine for Sunday School titled The Instructor published an article by BYU botanist Bertrand F. Harrison called The Relatedness of Living Things. And James E. Talmadge's speech, 
the earth and man. Jeffrey said, BYU biology students were not that well regarded in the real world of science because of their lack of knowledge about evolution, which is a vital component to biology. Dwayne E. Jeffrey was a professor of integra integrative biology at Brigham Young University. He has published professionally in various biological journals and in matters of Mormonism and science. Dwayne explains in an interview his findings on the research he did about the history of the church and evolution. I think the I just have a note here, Addie Blacker. I hope that helps. Jeffrey was getting his Ph.D. in zoology under the direction of world-renowned geneticist Kurt Stern when he got a call from BYU asking him to join its faculty. Jeffrey didn't want to teach at BYU because of its reputation in the science department, but he found out that BYU badly needed a geneticist. I had no intention of coming, Jeffrey said, but the students weren't receiving a good education. BYU had graduate students teaching genetics. When Jeffrey arrived at BYU in 1969, Howard was known as an evolutionist on campus, and Jeffrey said it was spoken as a depreciative. We tolerated the guy. Jeffrey said he let it be known that when he came to BYU, he was going to propose a course on evolution. I asked, he said, how would that be received? And they said, like any other course, you put together the proposition, it will be considered by the committee, committees and if it looks well put together it then goes to the board of trustees and if they approve it it goes jeffrey said jeffrey compiled his course and sent in the proposition and it got approved while still controversial the evolutionary biology course was well received jeffrey said the religion faculty had a harder time with evolution being taught than the students Dwayne jeffrey began researching the church's stance in history with evolution to better understand the whole situation. In 1974, he published a paper titled Sears, Savants, and Evolution, The Uncomfortable Interface, which reviewed in detailed articles, dates, and events dealing with the church and evolution. In uh, up to 2024, in 2014, evolutionary biology professor William Bradshaw began teaching the reconciliation of evolution with theism in his classroom in the 1980s. Bradshaw gave the same test at the beginning and end of his course to collect data about the acceptance of this reconciliation. During this time, there would be BYU students who would go to the religion class and have their teachers strongly condemn evolution, Bradshaw said, and then they would come to Biology 100 and be presented with the notion that evolution was true, but that it was not an enemy to their religious faith. Confusion. In, 19, in 2024, evolutionary biology professor Jamie Jensen began giving a similar test to see if this acceptance to the reconciliation of religion and evolution had changed or improved over the past few decades since Bradshaw's time at BYU. Jensen found that the data has improved dramatically between the two time periods. She said students are much more accepting of evolution, but that there are still a lot of students who felt as though they have to choose either science or religion. The following poster, which I'm not going to show, explains aspects of that controversy. Let me continue on. Our first and foremost goal is to keep people's testimonies, Jensen said. I see so many students that are standing on a precipice that doesn't actually exist, where they feel like they have to ditch their faith because the science makes sense. There is no reason one would have to abandon their faith to accept the science, Jensen said. Jensen wanted to do something about this. Representative Sean Carroll from Howard Hughes Medical Institute talked with Jensen and said he was interested in funding the collection of data from other universities and hosting a conference conference to encourage discussion and collaboration between the science and religious worlds. In 2016, the BYU Biology Department invited four other religious universities to its first Reconciling Evolution Conference in October 2016 with President Kevin J. Worthen in attendance. In that same month, the church released another article in the new era titled, What Does the Church Believe About Evolution? BYU opened an evolution exhibit in March of 2019 in the Bean Life Science Museum that illustrates the process of evolution at a macro level. There is a plaque posted on the exhibit hall stating that it is not church doctrine and the church has no official stance on the issue. In July of 2019, the BYU Biology Department hosted 18 different religious institutions from across the country to come and discuss the topic of evolution 
Constitution in relation to other religions and their institutions. This conference showed that the topic of combining evolution and religion for these other universities is also a very difficult topic to discuss. Although through the majority of the 1900s controversy existed in the church and at BYU dealing with the subject of evolution, the church has officially stated its neutral stance on evolution, and the BYU administration today has been supportive of the teaching of evolution. Those two prove, it's called prove your contraries. Interesting, interesting. Could they both be right? Could they both be wrong? Could one be wrong and the other one right? Well, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to be pick it up with James E. Talmage, The Earth and Man, the next time around. But if you have questions, have some great comments, comments, put it in the comments, and ask your question. I'll do my best to get to them and answer them the best I can. But until then, I wish you continued success. Goodbye.